Norfolk Federation um, and um, the staff, WEA. Welcome to Hingham for our case today. We're going to move on now to the tutor presentations. Um, and I will be introducing each tutor to you in turn. I think I've met most of you before. I'm Rebecca Pinner. I'm one of the course coordinators for Norfolk. Um, so, we're going to press on without any further ado. Um, so, I'd like to welcome Mary. Mary, please to press on. Thank you. Right, uh, good morning everybody. It's lovely to see so many people I recognise too. It's nice, nice to be here to tell you about the courses that I'm hoping to offer next year. Most of them you will have come across before, but I'm introducing a new one. Again, one of my tours through time, from the Middle Ages to the 20th century. This time, um, a moving story, transport and travel from the Middle Ages to the 20th century. Um, and this will cover both the development of types of transport, all the ephemera that goes with it, the surviving material evidence, which as anybody who's come across me knows that I'm really keen on, that you should be able to go around and be able to spot things which you might have just passed by before until your attention is drawn to them. So we get milestones, um, we have stories about the stagecoaches and the Norwich coach at Christmas with the inevitable turkeys hanging around on their way to London. And of course there were then also stagecoaches fitted out as turkey carriers because the turkeys paid better than the people. <laughs> so um, they were a, an early form of bulk transport of turkeys. The roadside inns, um, like this wonderful picture of Skoll with its magnificent sign across the road, which uh, didn't last that many years really, uh, cost over a thousand pounds when it was new. And the local carriers and local transport systems and going to market and that sort of thing. Uh, so we'll be looking at transport systems. This is uh, the remains of, you probably recognise it as Zizis. It started as Marshes, the carriers' uh, sort of centre in Norwich for their carrying business. So we look at buildings. We look then at water transport. Um, from the keels and wherries that plied the rivers, and this is from Buck's Panorama of Norwich in 1747, which showing a keel going up river with its square sail, and then the, the way they, of course, like the wherries, had to lower the mast to get <coughs> under the bridge. That's Bishop Bridge before they took the uh, tower off it. <coughs> and then the coming of the railways, and this is the first Norwich station the uh, Norwich end of the Norwich to Yarmouth line, which was the first railway, didn't connect up for a couple of years to any sort of network, but provided alternative transport to the route from Norwich to Yarmouth. And we look at all the ancillary vehicles that then made links with the station. Well, I th think this picture is lovely because it has three different types of <laughs> transport going down Prince of Wales Road or up Prince of Wales Road from the station towards the centre of Norwich. And then we look at goods traffic and the importance of freight in connecting Norwich and Norfolk with distant markets. This is a mustard train. It was one of eight a day that took Coleman's mustard to the wider world. And we then start looking at travellers and travel. Um, and uh, starting with people who travelled around Norfolk and gave their impressions of it. One thing that comes across from quite a few of the impressions of Norfolk, from Celia Fines into the early motoring <coughs> days of the 20th century, is that they complained about the roads. Um, this is a, a lovely uh, book, well it was a series of articles which has recent, more recently been put into a book, of Mr Stanilan's cycle journeys around Norfolk in the 1880s, with the boy um, on this rather strange Humber uh, tricycle. And he travels around and he sketches his uh, various places on his visit and then 
gives some indication of his impressions of them. So that makes an interesting viewpoint. Uh, earlier than that, we've also got tourists coming to spend the holidays in Norfolk. This is from Mr. Martin's journal of 1826, when he comes up via um, a steam packet up from London to Yarmouth, visits Norwich, um, tours around the local factory, just not, apparently knocks on the door and says, can I have a look round? That was Grout's Silk Works of eight, in 1826. Um, tours around the local prison, which was in the process of being built. Um, they just seem to give guided tours at, at a whim. Then goes up to Cromer for his holiday, and this is the typical my, the view from my window in the new inn at Cromer. Um, and a view of Cromer from the pier. And he does these wonderful sketches when he gets to Cromer. And then we have much more established artists like Cromer, and we look at people going the other way, going abroad and uh, recording their visits. This is Boulogne um, from, by Crow. He didn't go abroad very often, uh, but he did do some lovely paintings. And we get, yes, you're wondering what on earth is Napoleon doing there? Uh, people who go on tours around uh, Europe, John Barber Scott from Beckles, and I do cover East Anglia. I don't just stick with Norfolk. I go across the border to places like Bungie, um, sorry, Barbara Scott is from Bungie, not Beckles. And um, he goes down into the Mediterranean and it appeared to be almost de rigueur at the time when a, a Nap Napoleon was imprisoned upon Elba to pop over to Elba and see if you could see Napoleon. And so he records his meeting with Napoleon um, on Elba. And then there's another lovely journal of a visit through the Mediterranean, a tour to Constantinople at the time of the Crimean War. And they go up to the battlefield of Balaclava, as you do, and uh, are offered, <laughs> are offered um, souvenirs like a broken Russian gun, which he didn't bring back because it was too heavy. <laughs> and then the even longer journeys. We look at people on one-way journeys. So people who emigrate. Um, this is a picture of Adelaide in 1839. And we look at a family who travelled from Melton in Woodbridge across in 1839 to Australia and their arrival in Adelaide in 1840 and their descriptions of Adelaide as they go um, and, and of the journey. I have to say some of the entries are boring. It basically says, weather foul, wife and children not too bad, myself not well. You know, that, it goes on for it, it, three months. But, it, but there are some interesting snippets in the middle of it. And then we look at those who didn't want to go abroad and ended up going, and this is the penal colony of New South Wales. So we look at transportation and the families that went and what happened to some of them afterwards and the information we have on them. So, oh, before I come on to that, and finally, of course, we look at those who uh, do report back on their progress, like the lovely letter to Sir Thomas Beaver, by an ex-convict who says how well he's done and how grateful he was to Sir Thomas Beaver for transporting him. <laughs> um, so that is the new uh, course that I'm offering. And it can be for any length. I can compress it or extend it up to 10 weeks. So, uh, you know, which, whichever your particular branch prefers, that I can do. The style I, I tend to use, those of you who've had me before know this, the first half of the session is PowerPoint and explanation. And then I, the second half, um, we have, I hand out documents um, and we look at some documentary evidence because it's in these journals and letters and, and descriptions that often you really get to, to know what things were like and the people of the time. And, and they can be quite amusing. Now, the, the established courses that I offer, um, I've always offered the four, Norfolk's Industrial Past, um, I, people know my fascination with drains. Um, this is Young's of Dis, uh, a drain cover. You know, you start to read bits of old iron work if you have anything to do with me for any length of time on this course. It is fascinating to see how many little clues there are to the past industries of Norfolk. People forget how industrial Norwich in particular and Norfolk was. It's almost being airbrushed out of history. I think partly because it's not picturesque. You know, 
But that appears to be picturesque, you see, and everyone thinks, oh, that's beautiful, it's very rural. It was a cement works. <laughs> um, this is Bernie Arms. It had a life as a corn mill, then it became a cement works, and it ended up, well, as a drainage mill. You can see the scoop wheel on the side there. Um, so it's far from rural idyll. Um, again, we look at the transport connected to uh, industry, and this is Aylsham Mill with a wherry outside it. And we look at improvements, of course, in transport that enabled industries to flourish in parts of Norfolk. This, again, appears to be nice old buildings. Of course, they were weavers' houses in Norwich. This is Colgate. And that top floor was what they called the garret workshops, where the looms would be. Norwich always, they went upwards to, for their workshops because of the <coughs> narrow streets and the dark at the bottom. But then we get proper factories. Um, and this is St. James's Mill, built as a yarn mill, um, became a printing works. But in between, for a short time, for, as this old picture shows, it was Cayley's Cracker and Box Making Factory. Steam power, there's the engine house on the right-hand side, and, and it did have a like, tall chimney. And there was another factory over the road belonging to the same company. And so we look at the development of factories <coughs> and other places that have more than one existence. This is the brewery at South Creek, and it then became a razor blade factory. So, uh, you know, we look both at the <coughs> urban and the rural development of industries. Uh, large iron industries, the most surprising type of industry perhaps, iron industry in Norfolk, where you, there's no iron, there's no coal, you have to bring everything in, but they flourished, Barnards. Bolton and Paul's, all these grand firms, and then brush making and other industries that uh, survive in quite number, quite considerable numbers. And Aldrich's of Dis, this is one of, this was in their derelict factory, and it's obviously a publicity mat. Went in not just for brush making, but increasingly for matting, and specialised in these, this sort of uh, figured mat with uh, logos in it. Then a pastimes and leisure. We look at um, hunting and hawking, Mr. Sim Mr. Simmons of Norfolk there, uh, plays from the early game places of the Middle Ages right through to the development of theatres, the surviving Fisher Theatre, one of about 18 that the Fisher Co Company built around the area. Pleasure, spas and, and pleasure, pleasure gardens. Um, water places, watering places like this one, Thetford, the spring walks. I think people think it has to do with the season. It doesn't. It has to do with a, a calibiate spring that there and the pump house that made it for a short time a very popular spa. And then, of course, the development of the seaside and Yarmouth in its Victorian heyday. <coughs> And then we we have the pleasure gardens like the modern gardens of Norwich. This is Eaton Park, looking so like an 18th century pleasure garden, really, in that sense. And we cover a whole range of pastimes and leisure. And we look at fairs. This is the tombland where the fair was, major fair, caused a lot of... Um, conflict between the, uh, uh, the the priory and the city over the fair, and as I say, hunting, coursing, swatham, pugilism, gem mace, and uh, and assemblies and balls. And here is the Athenaeum, which was also the assembly house in the 18th century, and the subscription rooms library in the 19th at Bury St Edmunds. <coughs> I go on the, another course, the Company of the Preachers, um, the post-Reformation church. And people forget that the interiors of our churches owe much more to what happened after the Reformation than before it. Uh, everyone's very interested in the, med, med, the medieval church, but uh, it's what happens afterwards that you often pick up in the furnishings inside the church. An early table right at the beginning of the Reformation period, which has the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you written across the front, 
and somebody has added in the words, and blood. This is a reminder that you had communion in both kinds. The simplicity of the table, as opposed to the medieval altar, lengthways down the church, the development of communion cups, pulpits, and the importance, as in these non-conformist churches, where the pulpit is the feature of the church, not the altar. Uh, and this is at Walpole, an early non-conformist church. And, of course, the wonderful development of box pews and the three-decker pulpits. And uh, Hogarth's wonderful sketch of three-decker pulpits. And we look, the, the reason I call it the company of the preachers is throughout this, we're looking at the, char the characters that evolve during this period. Some very interesting characters. But often, I mean, I have to say, by the 18th century, there's the parson droning on with his learned sermon, um, and everyone else is asleep, apart from the clerk, who is enjoying himself. And the development of various nonconformist churches and chapels throughout the, the counties. <clears throat> Open-air preaching, the primitive Methodists, um, preaching on the quay at Yarmouth. And then the liturgist revival of the 19th century and the wonders of some of these grand Victorian interiors and, in this case, a Bhutan exteriors as well. Trying to bring back the Middle Ages. And then the return of Catholicism as, as an accepted religion and the development of Catholic chapels. Country life. What am I doing for time? A couple of minutes. Okay. Country life... Um, we start in 1700 with the pre-Reformation, pre-enclosure scene, uh, the squire and his lady. But here he is uh, wanting us to, to notice his, his enclosed fields and his grand crops and his sheep and that sort of thing. We move through um, livestock farming, the bases, tombs, the cottagers in their simple, we look at housing, we look at uh, the appalling housing conditions, model housing, model villages, and so on. The changes made by enclosure, this ruler-drawn landscape that you get, and uh, the poverty that came about, the rural unrest, the home of the rick burner with the devil in the background, this man, an empty cupboard, a dead wife, fatherless children, and encouraged to set light to things. The poor law and the harshness of the workhouses. And this poverty, we look at the rural idyll as portrayed by the Victorian artists of these lovely children out in the countryside, but we look at the ragged dress and the bare feet. How, you know, and you think middle class people were happy to have that on their wall? And then the alternative employments. Uh, Little engineering works like Soames of Marsham here. Um, and the alternative occupations or lifestyles that were provided by the promise uh, of moving abroad. There are some overlaps you will see between these courses because they are all different aspects of life in Norfolk and Suffolk. So, that gives you some idea of what I'm doing. I've produced a sheet here with the courses outlined on it, so if you want to pick one up. And if you want to ask me anything, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Hello, um, thanks for having me along. Um, I think I've probably been living with the Pastons um, since I first came across them in my undergraduate degree, which is now, well, longer ago than I would care to admit to, um, but let's just say it turned into a PhD and that's been going for seven years so far, so it's, it's a while. Um, and I suppose really part of the impetus behind the course is, is trying to kind of justify uh, why I spent so long with them, but actually... Um, I've become really passionate about these guys um, and this family and it's about spreading that passion and why they're such an important part of the East Anglian uh, cultural heritage um, and more specifically Norfolk heritage. Um, 
They left us the largest corpus of letters in English from the Middle Ages, um, over a thousand letters. And what we get from those letters are rich and vibrant personalities. Um, we also get lots of local detail about how things are working for the local gentry in the 15th century. And in doing that, we also glimpse how things on a national or international political level are kind of being engaged with at a very local, personal level. So we think 15th century, we're thinking the end of the Hundred Years' War, we're thinking of the Wars of the Roses, um, lots of conflict going on. And actually, this is about what happens on your sort of, I suppose the equivalent would be upper middle class. How are they, they reacting to these big events? Um, and are they figuring as largely in their psyche as it is in the national psyche? Not always the case. The beauty of the Paston letters are that they are diverse in subject matter, which lends itself nicely to um, long courses, short courses, and day schools. We can do a grand survey um, of about 100 years in over about four generations of the family to see how we've got generational differences, um, how we're going from a rags to riches story, uh, which I'll come on to in a moment. We can also look at things like warfare. We can track the ideas of love and marriage versus business and marriage. Um, we can look at local, um, well, actual fights, literally fights between uh, local gentry on the streets of Nor Norfolk. Um, that are being prompted by uh, claims of, well, lying about one's lineage, um, <laughs> which the Pastons and, and most of the other gentry in Norfolk are actually doing at this time. <laughs> um, but how do we have this information? I've said that there's a, a sort of the largest corpus <coughs> of letters, um, and we can actually see some of the letters, and depending on what you want to do in your branches, we can actually have a look at some of, I suppose, the raw material, if you will. Um, this is one example, um, and possibly one of the most famous examples. This is the earliest surviving Valentine's letter in English. Um, and I think it's only fair that I actually read it to you, because the beauty of the Pastons are their own voices, the distinct characters and personalities that are coming out of these letters, um, which, sort of on a long course, we really get to attend to, we really get to know these people. So this is this letter. Um, if your paleography skills are really good and you have excellent eyesight, you can follow along. <laughs> I, however, am going to use a transcription. Right reverend and worshipful, my right well-beloved Valentine, I recommend me unto you full-heartedly, desiring to hear of your welfare, which I beseech almighty God long for to preserve unto his pleasure and your heart's desire. And if it please you to hear of my welfare, I am not in good health of body nor of heart, nor shall be till I hear from you. For there knows no creature what pain that I endure, and for to be dead I dare it not discure. And my lady, my mother, hath laboured the matter to my father full diligently, but she can no more get than you know of, for the which God knoweth I am full sorry. For, but if that ye love me, as I trust verily that you do, you will not leave me therefore. For if that you had not half the livelihood that you have, for to the greatest labour that any woman alive might, I would not forsake you. <laughs> and if you command me to keep me true wherever I go, I wish I will do all my might to you to love and never no more. And if my friends say that I do amiss, they shall not me let fall to do. Mine heart me bids evermore to love you, truly over all earthly thing. And if they be never so wroth, I trust it shall be better in time coming. No more to you at this time, but the Holy Trinity have you in keeping. And I beseech you that this bill be not seen of none earthly creature save only yourself. And this letter was indicted at top crop with full heavy heart by your own M.B. <laughs> a mix of a very loving letter and a little kind of hint of retribution, well, kind of there's, a, there's an edge to it. Um, 
what we can get from this letter, or what we can glean from this letter, is that we have here a quite a loving relationship, but it's slightly in jeopardy. Um, part of the subject matter is that Marjorie, the person Marjorie is writing to, John Paston III, would like Marjorie to come with a slightly larger dowry. Marjorie's dad isn't going for that. Um, he, he's like, no, I've, the dowry is set a fair, and, and John will just have to accept it. Marjorie is clearly a little bit anxious that John doesn't love her enough to accept the dowry that's being offered. Now, surrounding that letter is, a number, is quite a range of social, economic, cultural expectations, i.e., why does John need a larger dowry? Well, he's a second son. He needs to marry well in order to kind of be financially kind of secure. And these are the sorts of things that we start to look at on the course, sort of taking some of these letters as case studies that we can unpack. So some of these letters we would come back to a few times, look at in terms of a few different angles, um, to kind of excavate just, just what's going on there, just what we can tell about the context of the time, um, and the anxieties and issues um, that these, these, um, this, the members of this family are engaging with. For a grander context, kind of, I mean, that letter is we'll, we'll be at the third generation. That's quite a way from where they begin. Um, and part of the early part of the course is actually set up, set up a kind of a, a feel for the, for the family tree. What we look at in this course, as I say, is four generations. We start at the very, very, very end of the 14th century, but we primarily kind of inhabit the 15th century. Um, so we, at the end of the 14th century the family start just in Paston in Norfolk <coughs> farming the land there we start with Clement a local freeman um, we don't know when he was born we only know his, his death date we know that he had a little land in Paston um, which he farmed uh, he had a little kind of uh, own or rented to a few other strips of land around that area so quite lowly beginnings if we compare to where they end up and this is the beauty of the pastons or i think the the appeal of the pastons sorry is that it's a kind of rags to riches story so clement on his own is doing okay but probably isn't going to get us very far um <coughs> as kind of up the social ladder until he marries beatrix summerton and this is another kind of key uh, interesting thing about the Paston family the women bring a heck of a lot to the table um, and a lot of the time it's really through the women that the Pastons advance. So we don't tend to, do, to, to divide um, sort of the, I think some people would quite like us to have just have kind of look at the Paston women or, or do um, a session just on women but they are such an integral part to the story that we, um, and actually their personalities just jump right off the page, that they form a fundamental part of the whole course. Um, so Beatrix Summerton, whose brother is very wealthy, um, marries into the family, and through her we start to see an interest in education, an interest in wealth, well not an interest, in the acquisition of wealth and an acquisition of land. And these are three ingredients that make the pastors, education slash culture, land and money. Sometimes in pursuing these things, um, it nearly breaks them. Um, but it's also the ingredients that make the local gentry. Um, it's a pretty standard recipe for getting ahead in life. Oh, yay! We haven't got much of the built heritage still surviving um, that's connected to the Paston family. We still have St Margaret's Church at Paston, um, which is a rather lovely church, and I urge you all to go there. Um, we have Oxnead Hall, which was sort of uh, massively rebuilt um, in the 16th century. Um, we have Strangers Hall, which uh, one of the later generations lived in, uh, in Norwich, if you're familiar with that, or uh, might be known as a Jernet's Bar. <coughs> Don't mean Strangers Hall, no, I mean Jernet's Bar. Um, and of course we've got St Peter Hungate as well in Norwich. Most of the other stuff which we cover on the course <coughs> got destroyed, usually by either the Duke of Norfolk or the Duke of Suffolk. Um, and actually, uh, the, the tale of the Pastons is quite a combative tale, um, full of 
sieges, um, open warfare, negotiations uh, with certain patrons to try and get uh, the king on side that usually fail quite dramatically. Um, it doesn't <coughs> always go well for the bastards. With William Paston, so the second generation, we start to get on this path to greatness. We start to get an interest in law, we start to see the family making a name for themselves. He marries in to another wealthy heiress who brings even more land. Oh. And we start to see the Pastons taking over Norfolk like measles. <laughs> and when we get to down here, more being Caister, we start to see them really make a name for themselves. Caister uh, Castle, Caister on Sea, <coughs> was built by the knight Sir John Fastolf, who was one of the inspirations for Shakespeare's John Falstaff, a knight that had <coughs> uh, performed really well uh, under Henry V and at the beginning of Henry VI's reign. On his deathbed, he left everything to John Paston I, eldest son of William Paston I. John Paston I was the only person in the room at the time that Paston made his will, um, which then made, uh, then caused really all of the subsequent problems for the Pastons. Um, they had to basically secure this castle for themselves <coughs> against some very, very powerful um, local aristocracy. So we follow the tale of Caister, we follow the tale of some of the other properties that they also inherited from Fastolf, which were also being eyed up by the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, um, and occasionally the Earl of Oxford as well. And then by the time we get to the later generations, they've actually started to make a name for themselves. So we'll follow kind of actually where, where they actually succeed in this um, holding of property. Where they succeed the court of Edward VI, um, no, Edward IV, because it's Henry VI and Edward IV, I get the Roman numerals wrong in my head. Um, and in doing that we see them actually start to become part of kind of the leading set at court. Um, they're engaging with um, the jousting culture, the knightly culture um, that's very prevalent at the time. So if you like knights on horseback, John Paston the second is your guy. If you like a diligent son that's going to kind of make sure that he's protected all your castles and got all your legal documents in, in, in you know, good condition, then John Paston the third is your guy. So you can see Oxnead, which is a bit later, um, but by the end of the, the uh, 15th century, we're now in a position where we're on the precipice of greatness. So this is, that's the bit where we start to see them become the Earls of Yarmouth, um, where we start to see and building great um, stately homes, um, which would eventually host Charles II. Oh, come on. Oh, oh it is slow. What I want to get to is basically an overview of what we can cover in, on a 10 week course. Come on. Is it playing ball? It Well, it doesn't want to play ball. So over a 10-week course, I'm talking through it, over a 10-week course we tend to spend two weeks um, looking at the Paston family tree. So meet the Pastons part one and two, because there are so many of them, um, and they're all very vibrant figures. Um, and I, I, in order to kind of try to do, um, to do it justice, we look at two generations um, per week. The Pastons and their local community which is basically an investigation of, of how or why do they keep falling out with the Duke and Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, um, and why we don't like the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, basically. <laughs> um, but we like the Duchess of, of Norfolk, um, and that's important. So we, we'll look at why we should like her, and why we should hate everyone else, um, and why some of us might go and shake their fists at Alice Chaucer's tomb in Yule. Didn't do that. <laughs> Not me. Um, but you will understand why um, if we, when we do uh, the Pastons and, the, and their local community. So the Pastons and, court, and the court of Edward IV, where we start to see the youngest generation of Pastons really making a name for themselves at court, getting a good, uh, really, um, well, good reputation. Um, they're a bit laddish. 
but we'll see some of that. Love in the Passons, part one and two, where we look at um, the author, some of the sort of the orthodox um, sort of business arrangements, the affection that could be found there. And then in the second week, the more unorthodox approach, sort of running off with servants, illegitimate children, um, generally <coughs> being naughty, I think would be the kindest way of putting it. The Pastons Besieged, where we look at how their properties um, that they were inheriting or buying um, through uh, or just purchasing were often under threat and who was being left to defend the castles, often quite surprising. And the Pastons at War, actually their roles within the Wars of the Roses. And then the last two weeks, which is um, where my research focuses on um, for my PhD, which is the Pastons and their literary network. Um, so in that, in that we really to excavate um, a couple of documents um, and actually see just how much we can get out of them and actually how much just attending to a few documents in a really detailed manner will um, kind of illuminate um, things where actually most of the other letters don't. Um, and then finally, it's kind of story time, the pasties and their books. Um, so the content, what are they reading and how do, does what they're reading share anxieties and issues with the other things that we've discussed on that course as well. So it's quite modular, so we can sort of, as I say, turn that into short courses and day schools quite easily. Um, there are over a thousand letters, they do touch on a number of other subjects, so if there are a few things you want changed around, if there's a particular interest that you have, then we'll see if we can swap it out a bit um, and, and um, make it more of a bespoke course for your brain. Elizabeth, sorry to interrupt you at the end there. How would you switch that to a seven-week course in particular? What would be your key elements to this thing? Um, well, so, I, I mean, it's, it's come from an eight-week course, so we right. could... I mean, we can... Some of those can be... Um, reduced into a few weeks or we can just take out some of the some of the areas so i mean as as long as we've kind of got that bit covered then we can kind of swap those around quite easily so you're amenable to a seven week course yeah yeah absolutely yeah thank you okay. Yeah. okay thank you any um i'll be around sort of in the in the break as well if anyone's got any questions yeah thank, thank you, you. recommended to me that I join as a tutor because of all the different courses I run. I applied. No, I didn't apply. I rang them and they sent me the paperwork. Now, I'm not a lover of paperwork. <laughs> and it took me, and I'm not kidding you, it took me six months to get that off the shelf and tell myself I really need to look at this because I wanted to. But I just, every time I looked at the first two pages, <laughs> hence, that was back in 2007. 2008, I actually joined. And here I am, seven years later, not one bit of regret in me. So I just want to tell you, first of all, that it took me a while to join, but I really loved it. I've met so many lovely people. Now, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint for you, so you've just got me, I'm afraid. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is share with you my journey, and as a tutor, where it's led me and how I've incorporated a bit of my life into WEA. <coughs> so I suppose my work is, I was originally a nurse and then I went into counselling. I've run elderly people's residential homes, had one of my own and I suppose it's quite natural that I'm going to be with the community projects. So I'm actually working with people who need help with self-esteem, confidence, communication, anger management, and so it goes on. Hence, I didn't do a PowerPoint because I didn't know where to start. And I didn't want to condense it all down so that you were just running away with subjects. 
but I do run quite a lot of different subjects at my request. So what I've decided is just to give you a little bit of a synopsis. Now, back in 2001, I joined an organisation that was in emergency services. And this organisation deals with crises, world crises. And I became very heavily involved in training airline staff, police, with bereavement. And that led me to start a course for WEA called Starting Over. It was a course I designed myself, and I've run it many times. And it's 10 weeks in length. Having said that, from the question from my last uh, speaker, I also have to adapt my courses, and can. I have adapted courses to four weeks and 10 weeks. Starting Over is aimed at people who have been through a major crisis or change in their life. Now this could be, this could be death, but often when we say bereavement, people automatically think it is a death, but it's, it's not. It's a loss. So starting over is really helping people to move on after they have experienced a loss. Now that loss could be, it could be a health loss, someone becoming disabled, someone not being able to work anymore, <coughs> redundancy, loss of relationships, so many different types of loss. So I put this course together and it's like 10 steps to moving on from a major crisis or change in your life. And at the end, it's where people really look at themselves and think, well, do I actually want to change myself? I've changed all aspects of what's happened to me, but do I want to change? So the last one is actually looking at our image. But it's a very fun course. I run my courses very informally. We have lots of fun, and they're pretty creative. Quite wacky, some people say, actually. <laughs> so, but I tailor them, as I'm probably tailing my speech here today, <laughs> because you look at the audience. I work with organisations like MIND, ShareStar, many different organisations in the community. Norfolk Norwich Hospital, I run courses there for the hospital staff. The one that I've run there quite a lot is communication skills. And boy, do they need it. <laughs> they have a lot of issues in there. But it was quite fun because I had a mixed audience. I had nurses, administrative staff, doctors, and it was great because I'd get them into discussions and they'd start to recognise the roles they played and how, oh, I didn't realise that's what you did and I didn't realise that's how you felt. So, so that, again, is very enlightening. Now, another organisation I joined four years ago, which has totally changed my life, was Toastmasters. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Toastmasters, but that's an organisation to help people with public speaking. I have become very involved in that and I have met amazing people through that. But I thought it was going to be people who just wanted to enhance public speaking or learn how to. But it isn't. The people that walk through our doors quite regularly are people who have had real issues with dealing with general life. My own nephew, he won't mind me sharing this because he shared this himself in speeches. My own nephew was doing a degree in nursing and was kicked off the course because he failed that particular assignment. That made him nosedive into revisiting a horrible issue that he had with stuttering. So he went to a speech therapist, and that speech therapist actually recommended he come along and join Toastmasters. I didn't know he was coming. <laughs> so you can imagine my surprise when he walked through the door that evening, and I saw him and thought, what are you doing here? This isn't where I expect to see you. But through the support, encouragement, learning techniques and skills, he has actually overcome that. He is back on his degree, doing exceedingly well, and he's been telling me how he's on a new placement and able to actually talk to people and have an opinion and join in the discussions. So that organisation also has been a huge development for me, but the my great thing is I've been able to take that into the course for WEA. And I, I designed a course called Finding Your Voice and Setting Goals. Now, another thing which is something which I'm hugely pleased about is I was invited into a men's refuge in Norwich. And this was back in March this year. The strange and funny thing was they had also written to Toastmasters 
but I didn't know that. And they were intrigued and interested to know if there was anything that Toastmasters could do for them. Now, I don't need to tell you, these, these men in this refuge have come out of prison, alcohol, drugs, and some of them go back into prison. This is what it's all about. So when I walked through the door as a WBA tutor, I just said, actually, I may be able to help you with something else. So what's come from that is I asked some members from Toastmasters if they would come with me into this refuge. And we gave them an entertaining evening. And it was entertaining. Because one, we didn't even know if they were going to turn up. <laughs> so we're sitting in their lounge. And the, the, the manager there, he's got a lovely buffet. He really treated us so well. But the guys were kind of just looking over the banister and thinking, I don't know, I don't know about this. So what I said to the members was, let's just do it. Let's just start a meeting here. So we did, and we set it all up and started having one of our meetings. Now, has anyone ever been to a Toastmaster meeting here? No. <laughs> it's very structured. Very structured. It feels very formal. There's a lot of hand clapping and there's a lot of hand shaking. But that's all done to encourage people and to, to really get you used to what you may have if you go out and do public speaking. But the wonderful thing was for these guys was they recognised very quickly the respect in that room. And when they did come in, and they did come in, one by one, they started to come in, especially when they saw food. <laughs> they did admit to me that was a big attraction. But when they started to come in, and they saw what was going on, they dared to take part. And we have now been doing that once a month. We have literally offered to go in, and the members just love it, because we see it's a practice. It's somewhere that we can actually practice anyway. So I'm telling you this because this is an element of my work which is growing, and I'm loving it, and I am very thankfully being able to involve it in the courses I already run, and also putting on courses for people with all those things in mind. So I'd like you to just bear that in mind as well. So although my aim is, as I said, to look for people to move forward in their life, but also to gain confidence, to gain skills, I think by looking outside the box sometimes and daring to explore things that we don't normally, and that's what personal development is about, I remember mentioning it to one of my relatives a long time ago. I said, uh, she said, what are you doing here? What exactly do you do? And I said, well, I suppose a lot of my work is looking inside. And she, I'm not kidding, she, she literally put her arm out like that and said, I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> so I suppose it made me realise, yes, this isn't for everyone. Just to leave you a very little story. A lady who came on my courses, when I first started, she came on anxiety management. She walked through the door, it was in a health centre. She was scared stiff, she had been treated very, very badly. She had been abused as a child. She's now 52, full of anger, swore like a trooper, was told to come on this anxiety management. Tried everything, nothing worked. Came through the door, I knew nothing about her. And she sat there, and she stayed. And the next week she came back, and she came back. That woman will now talk in front of an audience like this. She became very interested in religion, but that was something she was always fascinated with. But more than that, she was fascinated with nuns for some reason. She has now become an oblate nun at Ditchley Convent. They have completely taken her under their wing. And that woman turned her anger into love. And just to tell you how she did that, I was in a group, and this was people recovering from alcohol and abuse, and there was one lady I asked her to sit next to because she wouldn't stop talking. She was always interrupting and very, very angry. And I said, Maureen, just sit with her and just try to kind of control her a little bit. <laughs> and she came up to me in the break, and, she, and I was writing something, and she came up, she said, Anita, and her fists were clenched. She said, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to punch her one. I'm going to punch her. <laughs> I knew Maureen, I'd worked with her for a number of years, and I just looked at her, I totally trusted her, and I looked at her and I said, no you're not, now get back there and just do that. And because I trusted her, because I believed in her, she turned around, went back, I carried on writing, and then I suddenly thought, I suppose they would just check me. <laughs> so I looked up, she went up to this woman, and she just went, 
and this woman just went to her for a hug. When I gave Maureen a lift home, I said, Maureen, just tell me, how did you do that? How did you just change from being really angry into giving that woman a hug? She said, well, I've learned something. She said, I had all that energy in my body, and I didn't know what to do with it. So I decided I'd turn it into love. And it worked. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm known to some of you, um, not to others. Um, I am coping my wares as usual. Aviation enthusiast, aviation historian, and written books about aircraft. But my courses aren't about aircraft. They happen to be about men and women who happen to fly aircraft. Now, the new one I've, I'm coming up with at the moment, um, as requested by one of the branches, is Glory Days and Golden Girls. And I want to have a look at the period of 1929 to 1939. Amy Johnson is an example. What happened to her? Was she shot down by the Royal Navy? Well, we will find out. <laughs> Amelia Earhart. Was she a spy? Well, possibly. There are some that say she was. But what happened to her and Fred Noonan? So a new course being written up. Jean Batten, another golden girl. That was the golden era of aviation. It was an era of peace, an era of travel. And we've done travel leading into the uh, 20th century earlier on. So I'm putting wings on it. <laughs> Beryl Markham, another one. So the course will journey with me as we pull together the lives, the adventures and the misadventures of some of these people. England to Australia air race. How exciting <coughs> did that seem? Taking off from Milden Hall in Suffolk. And how you could actually f fly and sleep at the same time, way back before the Second World War. The Schneider Trophy races we'll cover, which were, happily, won by the British. Oops. And then we look at the storm clouds gathering, because they did. In that period, as we led into the Second World War, <coughs> then one gentleman, Adolf Hitler, and Hermann Goring appeared on the scene, and the world descended into chaos. We look at how Britain prepared for that. A course that I did last year, familiar to one or two of you now, Flappers and Flyers. And we're looking at some of the, again, another golden age in aviation, 1919 to 1929. And you may begin to get a bit of a theme here because they're beginning to link. Uh, and I'll talk a little more on that later. Alcock and Brown. I grew up with the excitement of clambering out onto the wings, how they apparently did, and their flight over the Atlantic. Or... Other women just simply having fun, and men having fun. There was the mixture. They were crazy days back in 1919 to 29. An amazing bunch of men and women. Elise de Roche. What happened to her? The first woman to receive a pilot's license. Her ambitions from an actress called the Baroness because it's better to be a baroness, really. She was apparently a plumber's daughter, but baroness sounds <laughs> better, doesn't it? We look at her ambitions and her fate. Elsie Mackay, one of the wealthiest women in the country at the time. Actress, aviator. Also a bit of a flirt, a bit of a girl. Several of them were. What happened to her and her ambitions to fly the Atlantic and Ray Hinchcliffe that went with her? And this young lady, sunbathing, naked on the wing of her aircraft. I mean, you could only do that in California. It would be a bit chilly in East Anglia, wouldn't it? But she got a kit off, climbed out onto the wing, and all was going splendidly until the engine packed up. <laughs> so she had a few problems. We would cover those. The flying Godiva. And other flying flappers of the era. Lillian Boyer, who seemed to have a habit of hanging off underneath the aircraft. 
So yes, they were girls that were doing it very seriously and girls that were doing it much more flippantly. Bessie Coleman, the very first black pilot. We look at the more serious side then, the things that she faced, segregation, and how being black and female, two great disadvantages to you in those days, how did she overcome those difficulties? <coughs> and what happened to her? And then, of course, a more famous name, the Lindberghs. We'll talk about their family, but a bit of background to Charles Lindbergh and to Anne Morrow Lindbergh. How did somebody who was such a great hero to the Americans fall from grace? What was his political journey? What was his love journey? And we look at his love journey and we look at both. And we look at a man who was, yes, an aviator and a hero, but also much more complex as a character. And we explore that. Airship heydays. People thought airships one day would be the mode of travel. That's how we would get about. Well, yes it was, but there were disasters and misadventures and we explore some of those and what happened to airships. And complementing it, of course, a course written the year before last because I was asked to do something on World War I. First World War, the centenary, 1914. So we take aviation from 1914 through to 1918 in War Wings, 1914-1918. A hundred years ago, Norfolk was subject to Zeppelin raids. And we look at the victims on the home front. The first people to die as a result of strategic bombing were innocent people in Great Yarmouth and Kings Lynn. And we look a little bit at those and we look at the story of the Zeppelin airships. Lifting our eyes up a bit, skywards, many of the soldiers did. It seemed a much cleaner war up in the heavens. East Anglian emphasis throughout the talks as well. Because I like to bring in family stories and contributions. And some of the stuff that I've dropped into my talks has come directly from WEA members. For example, 1916, if you were a pilot on the Western Front, your life expectancy was three weeks from the time you arrived. So you had to have a considerable <coughs> amount of courage to embark on that. Human interest is the strongest thing in all of my talks. This young man, a pioneer of technical innovation, but he fell out of his aircraft. <laughs> no parachutes in those days, why not? What happened to him? And the story of Archie Dexter, if you look on the table here, there is his photograph in a propeller tip, a classic from World War I, my wife's great uncle. That took me on a journey. It took us over to France to visit his grave, the very first people from the family to do so. So it was, again, a journey there that I hope you might share with me. Some of the Knights of the Skies, yes, there was chivalry. Sometimes it was sheer, cold-blooded murder in the heavens. Aces and otherwise. And sometimes, yes, the young women in their lives, because these were young men trained to be airmen, but clearly young men do have another interest, at least most of them, in my opinion, anyway, and that's young women. And society weddings, a dress by Lucille, Lady Duff Gordon, just to show that I can do a touch of culture. <laughs> what happened to the handsome aviator that this young lady married? And also there's a complete section on the working women. The women that made the aircraft, <laughs> Bolton and Paul in Norwich, we devote quite a bit of time to. This factory, a photograph taken in Ipswich, making propellers. They were the munitionettes, as they were called. And the difficulties they had to overcome, the resentment of the menfolk. And then was the nation grateful at the end of all of that? Well, we'll see. And what was a pull and pig? Some of you know what a pull and pig was. 
Some of you won't. You'd have to come on the course to find out. But also, you discover why there was a shortage of sausages in Germany. What went wrong? What caused this shortage of sausages? After all, jokes about German sausages are the worst. <laughs> and a spider web out of East Anglia. Well, what was that all about? What did it do? How did it help save the nation during the First World War? And for those of you that may see, parachute trials at Pullum. And it looks a pretty uncomfortable feature to me. Uh, the expression on that man's face. <laughs> and then we go from World War I to World War II. Because I'm working sort of backwards down through the courses that I cover. How World War II in <coughs> East Anglia affected the region. The civil defence preparations, the women's voluntary service, radar, the story of the men and the women that were involved in all of that, again, strongly with an East Anglian emphasis. Operation Pied Piper, 7,000 refugees coming up from steam on steamers from the Thames side and dispersing throughout the region. And some of the people that I've spoken to on the courses were those refugees. When aces meet, when this young man at the top in the RAF and that young man in the bottom in the Luftwaffe clashed in the skies near Ipswich, what happened to them? Why were they there? What happened to them later on in their lives? They were both aces, and an ace is any airman with five or more kills in aerial combat. And they met in the skies over East Anglia. And come along there, put some bloody life into it, that's RAF humour for you. Yes, there was a dark side. We look at, for example, we explore how did they go to the toilet in a Lancaster bomber, for example. <laughs> well, great mysteries, a lot less comfortable than you get these days. And the Romans, yes, the return of the Romans, they, another invasion by the Romans. I mean, they did leave us several hundred years ago, but they tried to come back in 1940, and they weren't terribly welcome. And searching for a lost Spitfire, because throughout my talks, very often aviation archaeology comes into it, because I'm one of these rather strange chaps that digs up aeroplanes. But through that, you get to the stories of young men, and sometimes then you go further back into their families. Nobby Hargreaves here, parachuted out of his Spitfire in Suffolk. It took us years to find it, and then even longer to find out what had happened to him, and even more so, the sacrifice that his mother made. Who and where was Herman? Well, he was a very unwelcome German visitor that we met on our travels, and some of you that have covered this course will know who he was, but don't tell the rest that haven't, so you'll spoil it for them. And this one, back, sorry there, a simple memorial tucked on a country lane in East Anglia. But behind it is a story of love and wartime tragedy of that young man, Joe, Nancy, how they met, how they connected, what their hopes were, and how their hopes were dashed in a tragedy over East Anglia. And the course that started it all for me, really, was the friendly invasion, or overpaid, oversexed, over here, as some say. And the Americans had a response. They said the British were underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. <laughs> so we look at that, 450,000 of them. And I'm holding this scarf because it represents something. A young American wore this scarf on his combat missions. It was his lucky scarf. One day, he forgot it. It was dropped down behind the locker. He took off without it. He was killed near Norwich. His friend picked this scarf up and wore this scarf until he was shot down. He was wearing it. He wore it through all of his days as a prisoner of war and he wore it on the death march. And it represents in that sense what I'll be talking about. Yes, aviation and aeroplanes, but people. And yes, other things. Social and cultural impact. Overpaid, oversexed. 
The expression, utility niggers, one yank and they're down, they said. <laughs> Christmas parties, Piccadilly commandos, if you don't know, well, some of the gentlemen perhaps will not admit to knowing who they were. Crime, segregation, race relations, all of that. Airfield construction, and why didn't they like Brussels sprouts? <laughs> Christmas time coming up, well, we'd find out. <coughs> we look at the medical supplies, how they supplied it. They built 58 hospitals in this country. It was a whole new ball game of warfare. What did they wear? You can have a look at the flying jacket there and the oxygen mask and flying helmet. Pickle barrel bombing and the battle for aerial supremacy we'll cover. And we will look at the individual stories like young Ray King here, one of the airmen that came over wanting to do his bit. He wasn't an ace, he wasn't even a hero, but he was a young man that was trying to do his bit. Aviation archaeology, this, that photograph on the left there was the one found in the wreckage of a bomber that we recovered near Norwich. The photograph on the right, Cliff and Jesse Behe, tells the story of GI brides. There were some 70,000 GI brides and we do a section on looking at the obstacles these girls had to overcome and the challenges they faced. And some of the relationships worked out very well and some of the relationships did not. Of course, human life is like that, and that's what we'll explore. So, testimonials. After all, if you can't blow your own trumpet here, you don't get a chance, do you? <laughs> <laughs> um, all sorts, simply the best, stimulating. Our tutor is excellent, full of just more than just information. Bullshit, somebody said underneath <laughs> there. I thought that would go rather aptly at the end. So the courses are available. Any questions, I'll be around lunchtime. I hope I've kept to the time, but thank you very much indeed. I was here not that long ago um, doing a, a day course on Tudor music in East Anglia. Um, which was just nice, and a nice lunch too. Um, and uh, some of you know me, um, um, uh, I'm an opera singer by training. I was born in Venezuela and uh, trained there as an undergraduate and then I had a scholarship to study at the Gijo School of Music and Drama and I specialized in early music. And uh, I have been now lecturing on music history for around 14 years or so. Um, and I live here in Norfolk. Um, and the best thing to do to find about my courses is to visit the all-encompassing, practically life-changing website. <laughs> uh, and uh, if you Google my name, you'll find it. Um, and uh, and you have all the all the courses there with all the descriptions. Um, and there, are, there is an obscene number. It's around fifty-five altogether. Um, so instead of pitching for one course here, I thought of do a, doing a medley of courses. And so what I, what I would like to, just to give an example of the kind of things uh, we do in, in, in my um, sessions, uh, is a little um, summary of what I'm doing this academic year for WA. I lecture also for all the, all the people, but they are not as important. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, don't tell Nadfaz that. <laughs> um, um, so, um, this uh, academic year, I started uh, with two courses. Um, one in um, Wales, and that was The Voice. I'm an opera singer, so I quite like talking about The Voice. Um, and uh, this is a course about um, the different classifications of, of operatic singing, from the Subret soprano to the hochdramatische sopran to the cavalier baritone to the basso profondo, and uh, and we went through a whole bunch of of, of, of different operas and different styles um, and different composers, but focusing on the voice uh, the voice classification and uh, and it's a kind of uh, opera history too. 
but focusing on the voices. <coughs> and uh, that's one kind of thing, thing uh, the things I do. I do it, when you go to the website, which I'm sure you will all do, um, uh, you'll find my courses in three uh, categories. You have music courses, music history courses, and opera history courses. Um, opera history covers a great variety of things, and so does music history. Um, music history is everything else that is not opera. And uh, music courses cover the nitty-gritty of music. So some branches are more interested in the actual bolts and things and how music works. So there's a course uh, which is the A to Z of musical forms. There's a course on um, uh, music theory, but in a nicer way than usual. Um, so that, that's, that's a possibility. Um, the other thing I was doing this term, which I just finished, um, was a uh, course on Johann Sebastian Bach. And that was a fascinating thing for me to do, because I learned quite a lot. Um, we did a lot of biography too, but, uh, but I, I don't tend to just go, you know, born in Eisenach, 1685. Uh -huh. Um, but to try to try to open some vistas for for um, students to go and do their own research because people are interested in different things and uh, and at the moment um, the Leipzig uh, archives have been finally opened uh, for musicologists so there's a lot of new research on Bach which we discussed during the class um, and this was the Norwich branch and uh, uh, we did things from the great works, choral works like the Christmas Oratorio or the, or the, or the B minor mass to the more mysterious pieces like, like the cello solo suites um, that new research is showing that it may have perhaps they were not composed by Bach himself perhaps they have been composed by his second wife Anna Magdalena Bach um, so all that uh, research is, is there and, uh, and I pointed out to various documentaries and things you can find online too, and also biographies, and the newest biographies too. Um, and I always have music in my courses, of course. There's no point of otherwise. Um, so, sometimes, depending on your experience of classical music, if you think, oh, you have Sebastian Bach, mm, can I really bear it for 10 weeks? There's only one answer, yes, we can, <laughs> we can bear it for 10 weeks. That's the opening chorus of the Christmas Oratorio. Um, and uh, so that was one. Um, I'm doing a couple of courses uh, next term. One is a controversial one. I like controversial. Um, and uh, controversial because it doesn't quite fit. It's in two parts. And this is the, the brave... Um, I branch in, in Suffolk, and uh, they have embarked on this. Uh, it's a two-part opera course. It's very simple, opera course part one, opera course part two. Um, and, uh, and they've done opera one, uh, uh, part one, and now they're embarking on part two. And we go through uh, the history of opera for around 400 years, um, choosing key composers, and uh, they've begun with Monteverdi and ended up with Gluck last time, and they're starting now with Mozart and ended up hopefully with Wagner. Um, so that's another thing. Um, the Norwich branch is doing a course with me on uh, opera in the new world, and that's a rather more esoteric part of opera, um, and uh, we're going to start that with the first ever opera um, uh, performed and composed actually in South America this was in Peru and this is uh, La Purpura de la Rosa uh, and then we carry on through the development of opera in America both um, so, uh, North America and South America and uh, we're going to end up with something quite exotic and this is um, 
I specialize in early music, but I also have a great passion for contemporary music. And uh, this is very contemporary as Mr. Philip Glass is still alive. I don't know for how long, but <laughs> hopefully till March. <laughs> and this, actually this is part of, a, of, of another course, which I haven't done for the WA1 uh, 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 branches yet, but I should. Um, and this is a course I devised, I, I also lecture on a, on a cruise liner uh, that specializes on art and culture cruises um, and pays for all my holidays. <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, I was uh, traveling uh, around the Red Sea and there is no music in the Red Sea. So I came up with this idea of doing a lecture on operas um, that had to do with ancient Egypt, and it's called Beyond Aida, the land of the pharaohs in opera. And these throw up a lot of amazing stuff, uh, that, which I hadn't quite tweaked, um, but it's all there from Chester Zorontea in the 17th century to Mozart's The Magic Flute, which is actually based in Egypt. And, uh, um, and we ended up with this, which is what we're going to end up also, the course on, the, on opera and in the New World. And this is Philip Glass Akhenaten, an opera about the, emperor, the, the, the pharaoh Akhenaten, who was the, the first, well, the only, um, uh, monotheistic pharaoh in Egypt. He changed the whole polytheistic religion in a great big revolution, which lasted only during his lifetime. And then when he died, the whole, they pretended that it never, had never happened and they destroy the, the city he built, they destroy everything, and, and let's not talk about it. Um, but, but Mr. Philip Glass has written an amazing piece, um, and this is a contemporary opera, contemporary American opera, and this is just a little glimpse of it. This is a duet between Akhenaten and his wife. Fascinating piece, um, the, the, the role of, of of Agnaten is written for a countertenor. And if you are hot on your, on your ancient history, uh, ancient uh, uh, Egyptian history, um, you, would have, you know that there is this, this statue of Agnaten and he looks, he looks like a girl. Um, he, it's, it's, it's very, it, it, the sort of research about what happened with this, with this pharaoh, and he, he may have had some kind of uh, hormonal Stuff. <laughs> he also had six daughters, by the way, so it wasn't a problem. It just looked a bit peculiar. Um, so, um, anyway, there are courses which are quite wide, like history of opera, clunk, um, and there are courses which are much more specific, uh, like the course on Bach or the operas of one particular composer. We did a course on, on the operas of, of uh, um, Richard Strauss, the operas of Giacchino Rossini, etc., uh, etc. Et and so I'm going to, I think I'm... I have to... Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to finish with a tiny little bit, which, um, which is a tiny little music example. Uh, one of my favorite, of course, opera composers. Um, he features in everything. He features in my uh, music history classes. He features in my operas of him. Uh, he, he features in my history of opera part two. He features in lots of things. And he features also in, in um, Beyond Aida, uh, um, the land of the pharaohs in opera. And this is, of course, Mozart. And, and this is the very, very end of the magic flute. I'll leave you with that. And when you go to my course, I'll tell you what the director asked me to do at that moment, <laughs> uh, which was very embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but I did it. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, all these courses are really an excuse to enjoy the most fantastic music, um, both sacred and secular, and from all... Uh, uh, um, history of, of, of music that we have um, and, uh, and also that's impossible to do without my partner this very ugly machine defeats 
the worst kind of village hall or church drafty thing that can, can, you can imagine. It always works. So anyway, that's me. Thank you very much. with you. Um, so that's what I want to concentrate on. Uh, but I also want to give you a bit of context, say a bit about who I am, although I do recognise an awful lot of places <laughs> around here. Um, I've actually been teaching for the WEA in East Anglia for nearly 20 years now. So, in that time I think I've been to pretty well every Northern branch, and quite a few of those in Suffolk as well. So I know some of you will be familiar with me anyway. Now essentially what I do I offer courses in, in two separate, really very distinct areas. One is in landscape history. Now this is my professional background. I've worked in museums for 15 years. Uh, I've had an interest in landscape uh, ever since I was doing A-level geography, essentially. And I still maintain that interest. Um, these, I've, I've got a couple of these, these lists. I haven't done handouts. Um, just some of the titles that uh, I offer. And what I mean by landscape history is essentially explaining to you why the landscape looks the way it does. Because once we start looking at it, we'll see that every historic period leaves its mark on the landscape. Um, so what I'm trying to do is explain why it looks the way it does, but also give some skills to you. Because it's actually quite easy to pick up the beginnings of how to interpret the landscape for yourself. So there's that side to it as well. Um, so just as a few examples, some of the things we might look at are some very distinctive features in the landscape. This is the Iron Age Hill Fort at Warren, up near Wells. Uh, probably the best prehistoric site in the county, but it has absolutely no influence on the way the landscape subsequently developed. This is one of the things that makes it Interesting. Um, you've all heard of North Elmham, but what about South Elmham in Suffolk? Um, this Minster Church, uh, which has been tidied up and uh, interpreted, what's the relationship or the possible relationship between North Elmham and South Elmham? Is there indeed any connection between them? These are some of the aspects of the things that I will talk around. Um, we will look at towns, villages, how they developed. Uh, Castle Acre, probably the best example of a planned <coughs> town in Norfolk, entirely a Norman planned town with all the elements there: the modern Bailey Castle, the cathedral, just uh, the, sorry, the, the monastery just off the picture, the marketplace, and so on. These are all elements that come into my courses. So it is looking at say the history of the landscape from the prehistoric right through to the present. And, oh sorry, I've forgotten that one. Ridge and Furrow. Um, what does Ridge and Furrow represent and why have we got so little of it in East Anglia? Um, you know, these are questions which I can address. And whilst talking about all of this, I can make suggestions to you as to where you can go in the region to see examples of all of these features. So it's meant to get you out and looking at the landscape for yourself. Which brings me on to the first sort of issue that I want to briefly talk about, which is that uh, this year what we tried to do uh, was promote uh, this idea of walks with talks. Um, this is partly to, to tie in with walking for health, but giving a particular sort of interest to it. And a, a group of us came up with a few ideas. It didn't really take off this summer. But what I'm hoping is that if we can sort of plan this a little bit earlier, then next year, for next summer, we can actually have a programme of ideas for you. Um, at the moment, we haven't really talked about how we're going to do this, whether we're going to produce uh, just a list of potential guided walks uh, with different leaders, different tutors involved, uh, and they'll just be open to everybody, or whether we will sort of do it more with the branches and ask the branches, are you particularly interested in any of these 
subjects. So that's something for us to discuss. Um, very obviously, for me, walking in historic landscapes is the title which immediately comes to, to my mind, um, because I also happen to do a lot of walking. Uh, our cameraman at the back, Dave, he rashly, perhaps, uh, offered the, the suggestion of walking with photography. So, you know, there are lots of ideas we can work around here. But what that means to me is leading a walk, and it could be anything from, you know, two miles to five or six miles, that's, that's open for discussion, um, through landscapes in which I can actually explain to you what you're seeing. I'd also like to bring in uh, sort of map reading skills into that as well, because uh, I get, and always have got, enormous pleasure out of interpreting maps. I would like you to have that same pleasure too. So all of this can be brought into it. And just as a couple of examples, I, I made just notes of uh, some areas which immediately suggest themselves to me. Uh, the area around Worcester, for instance, is there anything surviving of the textile industry in Worcester? We could walk from there up to the rather stray sort of Baptist community up at Meeting House Hill. Maybe come down to pick up the North Horsham Bill Canal at the bottom. But they're the sorts of things we could bring together. We could go up to Salt House Heath in North Norfolk. Look at the prehistoric Round Barrow Cemetery there. Walk to the edge of the heath to look down onto the coast. And I can explain to you how that coastline has changed and make some predictions as to how it may change in the future as well. So these are all the sorts of elements that we can bring in to it. Um, the basic idea being to encourage you to get out a walk a bit more. That's what lies behind the whole thing. So these are just sort of ideas at the moment. Um, so please, you know, over lunch, or whatever, do come and talk to me about this, or ask about it, or ask Rebecca, um, because you know, we would like to know if this interests because it is something we'd be very keen on encouraging. And so there was some funding available, whether well, that's still true or not, but uh, right. I didn't mention that, I didn't mention that. <laughs> so that's one thing I've specifically been asked to uh, uh, raise this morning. But the other thing, as well, follows on from my, my other, much broader subject range. Uh, this is just uh, a small sample of the wide range of courses that I offer. And yes, there is some overlap between us. Um, I've always had an interest in British radicalism, in, in <coughs> radical politics. And these courses, they've been described by another organiser as being either history with a political twist or politics with an historical twist. Um, because they're not meant to be about political theory or anything else. What I'm interested in mainly is, is how ideas change how they get into the public domain, uh, how the language that is used to express those ideas publicly, how that changes and reflects how the social conditions are changing. This is what lies behind it. I suppose the question I always want to ask is, do we actually ever learn anything from history, or do we just carry on repeating mistakes? There is always a contemporary element to this, because you'd be surprised once you start looking at political history, how much of it still keeps coming up today? And this is one of the main comments that I get coming back to. So it's mainly, it's the history of democracy, really. This is what particularly interests me. So they're just some of the courses that I offer. One of my favourite images that, that I use, here we have the freeborn Englishman. This was a cartoon by George Cruikshank which was published in response to the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. And it was one of the best-selling cartoons of its day. So here we have the poor English working man, the free-born Englishman, a padlock in his mouth, no freedom of speech, tied up in chains. Normally his pockets are turned inside out because he's being bled dry by taxation. And it's every image, every symbol you could possibly want is in this cartoon particularly relevant to this year, is what is he trampling over? Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. um, so here we have the freeborn Englishman. And all the mythology around the freeborn Englishman is a big feature of many of my courses. Uh, again, language, Thomas Jefferson and the American Declaration of Independence. 
Uh, all of this wonderful enlightenment language in the preamble to this document. But what I would argue is that actually it's a completely English document. It's a combination of the ideas of John Locke and our English Bill of Rights. So I always raise the point, well, maybe the Americans had the revolution that we should have had. But again, it's language and the way it's expressed. I can bring that up to date. Eleanor Roosevelt and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Again, something that uh, is very contemporary. Sorry, you... no. Um, something very contemporary. Again, it fits in with the work we've been doing this year, uh, celebrating 800 years of Magna Carta. Um, but, you know, I, these, these issues come right into the contemporary. Uh, it's that bloke from Thetford, again. <laughs> There's a lot of nodding going on there. You've seen him before. Um, I ran the museum in Thetford for a number of years, so I actually had a professional responsibility for this man, which was very nice. But, um, yeah, Thomas Paine has a, has a habit of appearing in quite a few of my courses, so you'll get used to, to hearing about him. Um, but that sort of brings me on to the other thing that I want to raise. And this is really asking you to think a little bit more about day school. In particular. Now, I know a lot of branches, of course, already run day schools, um, but this is something that uh, I was talking about uh, at some length with Phil Cowell, who was our regional manager until September. Uh, something he was very keen on and trying to encourage branches to use day schools a little bit more. And something that he was interested in, and which I'm very interested in as well, is actually linking day schools, to actually follow and pick up particular themes. So in terms of the sorts of subjects I offer, there are some very obvious ones. This is something I've done this in Norwich before. Two day schools, you know, a month apart, fortnight apart, one on, Thomas Paine, The Rights of Man, followed by Mary Wollstonecraft and The Rights of Woman. Not just about Thomas Paine, not just about Mary Wollstonecraft. We'll be talking around the issues, and this is an aspect of my courses which is very important to me, I want there to be discussion. Now, I don't want to stand in front of you talking at you for a couple of hours, which I'm very capable of doing, but <laughs> it's discussing. So it's talking around what might come out of that. That's the whole idea behind it. Again, these are just a few ideas I, I put together while I was just, just assembling this PowerPoint, really. Um, Looking at particular historic periods, you know, the 18th century through to the end of the 19th century. And again, it's very easy to run these subjects together as a series. And again, it illustrates very well what I'm saying about you can actually see the way the language changes and is adapted, the way the ideas change by following this sort of sequence of events. Um, I hope this is all sort of making sense. Um, another idea that comes out of this, which is something I'm very keen to pursue, uh, and it's something which I really need to take up with other tutors. I teach courses on the 18th century enlightenment. The obvious thing to do is, if you've had a course on the enlightenment, or just a day school on the enlightenment, is to follow it with one on romanticism. Because the romantic movement was very much a response to Enlightenment thinking becoming far too clinical. There was a need to, to put human beings back into the world, back into nature, make that connection again, and forget about the application of reason which comes out of the Enlightenment. Now that's something I can talk about some aspects of Romanticism, but that would be something I would want one of our other tutors to do. So the idea of actually sharing day schools between tutors, but working together, uh, that's an idea, I think, which could be developed in a lot of... Possible. I'm looking at Rebecca now, see if she's nodding oh, yes, out. Yes, 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 I see. She's I was focused. catching the eye of some of the other tutors, and they were nodding as well, so yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's one of the ideas behind it. Um, I just put these up. These are not meant to be necessarily linked ones, but again, just to give you an idea of the sorts of things I talk about, the sorts of things I have talked about now. Take a risk, do something challenging, look at anarchist thoughts, and I can guarantee you that would generate a lot of debate. It always does. Um, utopia, I am known for having this, this habit of 
coming up with slightly odd titles. So Utopia, there's no place like it. Right? You, please forgive me for that. <laughs> but you can see where it's, it's coming from. So, two things then. Uh, and to say, do please talk to me about both of them. This idea of guided walks, but with some additional interest on them. Not just my ideas, but other ideas too. And thinking more about how we can actually use day stores, link them together, follow themes with them. Um, something which quite a few of us are, are very keen to do. And to get back, in some ways, uh, to one of the, the, the principles um, ethics behind the WA, the idea of social purpose, that the WA should be involved with creating you know, a better, more informed democracy. This is one of the aims of the WA. I'm just trying to do my little bits to encourage it, basically. Right, I told you I was going to be brief. That was good, wasn't it? Uh, so any questions? <laughs> If you've got any questions now, please do. Otherwise, say I'm around for lunch, so do please ask. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. This is more an offering than a presentation. And what I'm offering is three different focuses, of course, or foci of, of courses. Um, one is grouped around some remarkable Norfolk personalities. And what we do there is look at certain personalities that are of significance locally and of significance nationally, and we set them against the historical context to which they relate. So, for example, if we look at Herbert de Lezinger, I suppose he's a product of the Norman Conquest. So we have a look as to why the Norman Conquest should have come about, what the effects of the Norman Conquest were, and then hone in on Herbert de Lezinger, who some of you know was appointed as Bishop of Thetford with a certain scandal that is recorded in the oldest piece of um, uh, figurative painting left in Norwich Cathedral. So we're home in on, 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 on him and he's quite a wily character, I must say. Or if we look at the end of the list, um, uh, Dorothy Dewson, for example, and the rise of the feminist and the socialist movement. She was uh, an active suffragette just before the First World War, but also prominent in the broader feminist movement. So we look at the women's movement from the late 19th century into the 20th century, concerned with issues like family allowances and birth control <coughs> and equal pay for women and, and, and those sort of things. And she was also prominent in the Labour Party, uh, on the left wing of the Labour Party, member of the Independent Labour Party. She would certainly be a Jeremy Corbyn supporter, um, if, not, uh, if, not, if not more. And that's quite interesting, having a little look, perhaps, at the early Labour Party and socialist movement in view of what is happening in the Labour Party at the, uh, um, at the moment. So we both look at the feminine issues uh, and socialism and the role that Dorothy Jewson was playing in those, both locally <coughs> and nationally. So there's a whole list of personalities here, and uh, we can construct uh, any course you like, really, of any length. Um, you can just do it on a completely, not quite random, but a pick and mix basis, pick the people that appeal to, or we could try to group them in some sort of loose theme, and I've made these sorts of suggestions um, about that that uh, you might like to talk about. A um, couple of other types of courses that um, I'm offering. Uh, one, the struggle for democracy in Britain. Well, of course, Chad's talked a lot about, uh, um, um, about that. But I don't know who you would root to be the first modern constitutional monarch. Elizabeth I? Charles I? <laughs> William III? George III? <laughs> William IV? <laughs> Queen Victoria? <laughs> George V? Well, I don't know. I have to pick one. There's something to be said for a number of them, actually. But if you had to pick one, I suppose it would be Queen Victoria uh, would be the safest bet there. Um, so there is a struggle that goes on, really, between the King and Parliament for Parliament to establish control over, over, the, uh, over the monarchy. And then there's a struggle, of course, to make Parliament uh, a democratic institution that some of you might think with concern about the House of Lords, and we still haven't got proportionate representation, if that takes a fancy, the battle is still going on. So we have a look at the battle 
from the 16th century uh, uh, onwards uh, of the attempt to spread the vote. And we didn't know, as you may know, we didn't even get manhood suffrage until 1918. Only about two-thirds of adult males had the vote before the war. And of course, it's 1928 before women um, uh, are equal franchise. But another um, course you may be interested in, I've called it from the cradle to the grave which you may know is a term associated with the welfare state. So we might think, uh, is there anything special about the welfare state? Or is it just a clever bit of spin at the time, and we've had quite a lot of spin? So we'll have a look at that question by looking at the development in the 19th and 20th century of the poor law and social security, housing and sanitation, education, medical services. And um, it's quite interesting, as Chad was saying, how debates don't necessarily die or are often resurrected. So we've got a lot of debate about work credits at the moment, family credits. Well, we can go straight back to the 1830s and look at the arguments about the reform of the poor law and the Spielenum system, system there. And um, a theme that I think we might sort of pick up as we go through is the relation <coughs> of the development of social services to aspects of austerity, including, including poverty. And if we're thinking about the current debates for and against austerity, is it the only way to go, or is there an alternative? Well, the structures, the structure for that <coughs> goes straight back to the Great Crash, the banking crash, and the slump of 1829 to 32, and the arguments um, surrounding that. So that's what we'll uh, be having a look at in that course. Um, well. All these courses can be adapted really to any length, of course, including a day school. And um, so far as a course is concerned, because of family holiday timetables, uh, it's really the springtime I'm looking at, because we often like to go off a little sort of a city break in, in the autumn. So it's really sort of spring or maybe summer. But a day school, we can find a date for any time, really. So um, I've given you the handout. The other thing I might just point out, I don't know if the colour suits me. <laughs> <laughs> and as it go. But I don't work with PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint and I, we never quite managed to get, get together. And I prefer to work with a series of handouts. And I've just given you an example there that has some um, pictorial elements, uh, if, if, if it suits, but also some documentary handouts that we can look at. And I am a bit notorious as trying to squeeze a court into a pint pot. Is that the right, right, right way around? Anyway, um, uh, and the way we manage, of course, is just part of informal talk and discussion, and I'll have a number of points, you know, that um, uh, might might simulate that. So, if you'd like to talk to me during that time, I should be here during lunch time. I am peeling a bit, uh, but um, maybe you might recognise me if you want to, and I'd be interested to meeting some of you. Okay, thank you very much. The history we were all taught, I suggest, was pretty much Anglo-centric, and it was very much um, by men, about men. Today there are probably more women than ever writing history books, novels as well as academic history, um, which gives a different perspective. Alison Weir, Philippa Gregory, Hilary Mantel, among many, many others. And in the last 30 years, there has been a, uh, emerging a new genre, feminist history. Feminist history, as a bloke, which is what I is, seems to be based on the principle, the premise that all previous history was misogynistic. And a lot of feminist history is quite rightly correcting that, but the pendulum has, pendulum has swung right the other way. Nevertheless, because of what I said earlier, I thought I would offer this course. <laughs> All the women I will be talking about ruled, or, to use a, a broader uh, term than ruled, if you like, had serious influence 
in the 16th century. All of them are 16th century women with power. Now, of course, we all know about her, and we all know about her half-sister who ruled before her, Bloody Mary. And therefore, I'm sure you will all recognise her. And probably also this woman, Isabella of Castile. Now they were all what are called Queen Regnant, or Queen's Regnant. That is, they ruled by right, not because their husband was the king. So you had the king, like Prince Philip is not a king. A king. Was he ever crowned? I don't know. So he's, he, he, never, he isn't and never was a king. He is the consort of the right, rightful queen, Elizabeth II. But those women I've just mentioned were all queen regnant. They ruled by absolute right. Isabella ruled until 1504, so she does fall into my 16th century time frame. When she lived, and indeed during the rest of that century, women were pawns in the marriage market, married off for dynastic or territorial reasons, never a thought of things like compatibility or, dare I say it, love. But she, Isabella, evaded that. She evaded an arranged marriage by her brother, King Henry of Castile, by betrothing herself to Ferdinand, King of Aragon. They each ruled their own territories, both in Spain, of course, but they are linked together for three reasons, actually four. Four because if I'm right when I said earlier that history was mainly by men about men, then it's Ferdinand and Isabella, not Isabella and Ferdinand. Nevertheless, they pretty much ruled their uh, Aragon and Castile separately, but they are linked together for three reasons. Firstly, for completing what's called the Reconquista, which was driving the Moors completely and utterly out of Spain. Secondly, that last bit there, well, that gives you some idea of the relative sizes of their of Ferdinand and Isabella's two countries. Secondly, they created, if that's the right word, the Spanish Inquisition. And since Isabella was the more religious of the two, it's perfectly reasonable to say that she had the major role in establishing the Spanish Inquisition. She was the driving force behind it. And the third reason that they are usually remembered, if at all, is because they funded Christopher Columbus' voyage to America. Then there's her two daughters. Joanna was married to Philip of Burgundy and is known usually as Joanna la Lorca, Joanna the Mad. This was because her husband, Philip of Burgundy, managed to convince everyone that she was insane and he locked her up so he could rule Castile. And her father, Ferdinand, was quite happy to go along with this because he was in nearby Aragon and therefore with, Bur with Philip way over in Burgundy, he could continue to have influence and indeed rule Castile with Joanna locked up. And her son, Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, <coughs> continued her incarceration so that he could rule, and not just Castile, but also Aragon, because by this time Ferdinand had died, also Burgundy, most of Germany, the Netherlands, and lots of Italy. Isabella's other daughter, you will know, wife of our King Henry VIII, previously married to his older brother, Arthur. Now, although Catherine, you would think, and would probably say, was merely a queen consort, 
you should really know that she was Henry VIII's close political advisor until Cardinal Wolsey insinuated himself, particularly when Henry VIII went off to France in 1520. And when he did, he made Catherine regent of England with powers to rule in his absence, powers to tax to raise funds, powers to raise an army even, which he did. Because as soon as Henry popped over, got the ferry over the channel, James V of Scotland invaded. In 16th century France, women ruled as regents for underage sons, like this woman. Catherine de' Medici. She ruled for her son, Charles IX, and in a sense, she learned to rule the hard way. The main influence on her husband was his mistress. Her husband, Henry II of France, not of England, Henry II of France, was his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. Now, Diane had the bedroom immediately below Catherine of Anne. Catherine de' Medici, I beg your pardon. And aware that she was not getting any younger, Diane was 19 years older than Catherine, and that therefore her, Diane's, position, as it were, was reliant on the good favours of Catherine, who herself was likely to be shunted off because she'd had no children, which was her whole purpose in life, of course, Diane would, um, as it were, get Henry II uh, fired up and then send him upstairs to his wife. And she was very successful at doing this because Catherine de' Medici had ten children. <laughs> two kings and two queens, more important for the purposes of this idea for a course. And since Elizabeth never actually ruled in the sense that I'm using the term, huge influence, etc., we will look specifically of Marguerite, Queen of Navarre. Diane was mistress of Henry II of France, King Henry II of France, before he inherited the French throne. And at that time, she had a rival. Anne de Pisilleux. Anne was the mistress of Henry II of France, his father, King Francis I. The two women hated each other. Anne, at the same time as being the mistress of Francis I, was sleeping with Charles V, who I mentioned earlier, who locked his mother up. Yeah? Sleeping with Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. And she, Anne de Pisilo, divulged to Charles France's military st strategy when he and our, he being Charles, and our King Henry VIII invaded France in 1544. We'll also look at other women. Lady Jane Grey, of course, was not actually crowned, but she did influence events leading up to the coronation of our Queen Mary I, Bloody Mary, who she's also known as. Louise of Savoy was the mother of Francis I, who I just mentioned. He was captured by the aforementioned Charles V, which is why in this picture, Louise is holding the rudder of state because she ruled while her son was incarcerated. And she sought the help of Suleiman the Great, leader of the Ottoman Turks, here shown under her feet. She sought his help in getting her son Francis released. Jean d'Albret was Queen of Navarre. Margaret was Regent of Netherlands for many years. And other women that we shall explore in the course include those. This is early, this was an idea I had for a course, and when I suddenly had an email saying, you're on, 
next, Wednesday, next Friday. It's been a bit of a runabout uh, trying to work out what exactly uh, this idea uh, might develop into. And so far there are 19 women. And that is the idea of the course. There may be more, I don't know. But I, at the moment, that's more than enough, I think, for a course um, without going into the, 60th, the, the 15th, back to the 15th or into the 17th century. There's enough there, and I suggest a good variety. So, that is the idea for the course. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and I'd like to say thank you to Rebecca and to yourselves for inviting me. I have hands up at the beginning. I'm from Suffolk. Oh. <laughs> I didn't make my way over the border unseen. I just hope I can get back in again tonight um, before anybody notices that I'm missing. Um, but although, although obviously I'm, I'm living in Suffolk, um, I'm very happy to, to come up and uh, to do some teaching um, in Norfolk, is that, if that's what you would like. Um, I've just actually completed my very first term of WEA teaching. I've not been with you for very long. Um, and I will be leading uh, more courses next term. Um, but I've, I've been thoroughly enjoyed my first term. It's been very eye-opening, but it's been, it's been a good time. Um, but as well as um, leading courses for the WEA, um, I also um, teach and have taught for many years for the Suffolk Records Office um, down in Ipswich. So I'm quite experienced. Um, and uh, there's um, three courses I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, one of my main interests and one of the main areas of my doctoral research was um, medieval drama. And the, the plays of the medieval period and the early 16th century are a particular passion of mine. And I was quite intrigued, actually, when Rebecca wrote to me and said that uh, we were meeting in Hingham today, because I am wondering, and she might uh, be able to confirm this or not, whether Hingham is the birthplace of a monk from Berry Abbey called Thomas Hingham, who may have been one of the original owners, or indeed scribes, of some of our surviving East Anglian medieval plays. Yeah, it's a wonderful connection, and I hope that it's true, yes. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about one of the courses that I lead, which is entitled Drama Before Shakespeare. Now, unfortunately, the plays of the time before Shakespeare started flourishing are really quite unknown, which is a shame because they can be described in all kinds of ways. They are they're incredibly spectacular, but they're also very moving emotionally. They're quite bombastic and over the top, but they're also very reverent and pious plays. They're very, and there's, they're very complex, but they're also wonderful, wonderful entertainment. So, using video clips and surviving scripts of the play and surviving archival records, um, this course really is an introduction to this very little-known drama. Now, one of the most interesting things about medieval drama uh, from Britain is its regionality. The, uh, the drama of Cornwall, for instance, is very, very different to the drama of the northern cities, which in its turn is incredibly different from the drama which came from East Anglia. Um, and so for this reason, my course starts with an exploration of probably the best known form of medieval plays, the mystery cycles. Huh? Well, I've got the oh, it's taking time, it's a little slow today, yeah. Um, some of you may know that uh, York in particular still puts on some of its plays every year, so this is a, a reconstruction of one of their, their pageant wagons. Um, and we will look at the, uh, the mystery cycles of the northern cities, particularly York and Wakefield and Chester. Now, um, of course, these are collections, they are cycles of short plays, uh, which really were intended to glorify God in a time which was incredibly religious. These plays were put on for the glory of God, um, and also to instruct people in the historical basis of Christianity. So as a whole, the play started with the fall of the angels and the creation of the world, right the way through to the Last Judgment. Um, 
And this play, the Last Judgment plays are often plays which ask people to choose a side. Are you on the side of the angels or are you on the side of the devils? And I'm a big fan of medieval stage devils, so they do crop up an awful lot <laughs> during this course, I'm afraid. Um, so all of these plays in the mystery cycles uh, were performed over the course of one day on um, especially designed wagons. This is a, a one from the, the story of the creation. And when the computer moves on... Yep, there we go. We've got some more at the top here. We've got um, a wagon for the crucifixion play. And underneath, one from the story of the temptation of Adam and Eve. Um, so, um, as we study these plays, we'll examine some of the scripts. And I can assure you, I won't actually expect anybody to act at all. Acting is not compulsory on this course, <laughs> just an enjoyment of the plays as they are. Um, but we will also discuss how these biblical, char biblical characters are presented. How are they like the characters from the Bible? But also, how have they been changed to fit in with a more contemporary uh, setting? How have they become medievalised, as if you will? Um, we will discuss how these plays interpret uh, well-known stories from the Bible. But also how the plays could perhaps be seen as... Maybe the craft guilds that put them on promoting themselves. Perhaps they are advertisements uh, for their wares and the quality of the work that they were did. That they did. But we'll then move on to look at the practicalities of how these mystery plays were put on, how they were organised. There was a lot of organisation that went into them, and how they were financed, who the actors were. Um, the looking into the design of the costumes and the props, and also the construction of these fantastic pageant wagons, which were always specially built for the occasion. But once we've spent some time with the mystery plays, we're then going to focus in on the drama which comes from this area, comes from East Anglia. Um, and we'll be exploring the, uh, the drama of the 15th and early 16th century from Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex. Now, this part of the course begins with studying a play called Mankind. There we go. Um, which, and this, uh, Mankind may well have been performed at Christmas. Um, it can be enjoyed on many levels, this play, because it is the story, the classic story of the everyman. And in this uh, picture here, you can see Mankind's there, uh, the one in the middle with a cross around his neck. Um, and he is an agricultural worker, as so many people in East Anglia were during the Middle Ages. And he finds that he is tempted by four vices, and there's three of them at the back there. And they want him to give up his, both his agricultural work and his, and his prayer. And to give in uh, to the sin of sloth by um, just joining in with their fun, really. But Mankind is, uh, is a very pious gentleman and he thinks, no, I'm not going to give up that. And he refuses to give in to their temptations. So in their frustration, they, of course, conjure up a devil. <laughs> this is a fantastic devil called Titibillus who crops up all over the place in medieval art and literature. And he does achieve the temptation of Mankind in various different ways. Um, in many ways, this is a very sophisticated play. Um, lot, um, there's quite a lot of um, Latin that crops up. Some of the humour is in Latin. Um, but the vices themselves are incredibly earthy characters. They use uh, very crude language. They sing an incredibly bawdy Christmas song, which I would never dare repeat <laughs> in such an um, elevated company as today. But I might let you in on it on, during the course. Um, they also indulge in many dubious bodily functions, and their favourite game, of course, is football. They decide right in the middle of proceedings that they're going to stop and have a game of football. So you've got this great contrast between the sort of high-minded Latin thinking and these vices and their earthy language. Mankind is also an excellent play to um, um, illustrate common themes and devices in East Anglian drama. So um, we will use it to look at sort of the common themes that were running through medieval drama at the time, as well as exploring the practical side of putting on this type of play. So again, costumes, stage effects, um, and also things like how the play was financed. What did, how did people in the Middle Ages get people who came to the play to actually part with their cash 
what kinds of uh, things did they use to do that. Um, and we'll also um, compare it to another medieval play, probably after the mystery cycles, the most famous, Every Man, uh, which, isn't a, which isn't an East Anglian play, but has the same themes running through it, and which was recently put on an excellent production by the National Theatre, starring a Chiwetel Ejiofor. Um, so uh, we will compare the two plays. The next sessions of the play, uh, the sessions of this course, uh, which uh, explore saints' plays, which were very popular in medieval East Anglia. Um, these plays include one about um, Mary Magdalene, um, and in the course of this play, she actually leaves the Holy Land and travels across to England, where she survives a spectacular shipwreck. Um, and once she arrives in England, she performs many miracles. Um, and another play about St Paul, the conversion of St Paul. Um, and this includes, as well as um, the most spectacular conversion scene, which involves bright lights and sudden explosions, it does involve stage devils. In fact, a comedy scene involving stage devils. We will also discuss medieval East Anglian biblical plays, including the, uh, the story of Abraham and Isaac, for instance, and um, the, the story which we are thinking about a lot at this time of year, we're connected to the Christmas story, the, the slaughter of the innocents by Herod on his discovery of Jesus as the king of the Jews. Um, I thought I'd include this fantastic stained glass window from St Peter Mancroft in Norwich, because it really, it, um, illustrates this story very well and um, the connections between East Anglian art, literature and drama at the time is something that we will explore in this course because we are so lucky in this area with the richness particularly of the arts that we have around us that it's a very useful thing for making links with drama. The second part um, of this course of drama before Shakespeare explores how um, small communities in East Anglia managed to stage these absolutely wonderful plays. Um, we will look, to start with, at professional entertainers and um, players who would come to communities um, to put on plays, but we will also look at how the communities did it themselves. How did they put on parish plays, which they did quite often to raise money for their churches. Some communities um, had their own purpose-built theatres at the time. Uh, down in Suffolk, Walshamley Willows had its own purpose-built theatre, and there's a lovely reconstruction of an open-air theatre. But also the towns of Bungie and Great Yarmouth had their own purpose-built theatres by the time we move into the 16th century. And some of the plays themselves, um, such as one called The Castle of Perseverance, actually have staging plans preserved with them. And this is absolutely beautiful because it shows staging which um, is required for performance in the round and actually this area here is a ditch which is required to be dug before the play can be put on because some of the characters disappear into it so that's a real real challenge for the community that's got to put it on um, the course it, um, itself will end with an exploration of the link uh, of plays as community events and fundraising tools um, and as part of this, we, we, the final play that we will look at is slightly later in the 16th century, um, almost a contemporary of Shakespeare's called Robert Greene, who wrote a, a play called Friar Bacon and Friar Bungie, which is so local that um, lots of it is actually set in the north of Suffolk and the south of Norfolk and includes a character called the Fair Maid of Fressingfield. She is the heroine of the piece. And I was actually lucky enough to go to a community performance of this some years ago by the Halston Players. Um, so it's, it's a lovely play, very, very set in East Anglia and well worth studying. Um, if possible, um, as an extension to the course, it would be lovely if we could actually go and see um, a, a performance of a medieval play. They're quite <laughs> rare, but they do happen. In a couple of weeks' time, I'm off with some of my students from the Colchester branch to see some um, medieval Christmas plays that are being put on. So it would be lovely um, if that could be part of any other course that I might teach. But drama was just one of a huge variety of entertainments and festivities in the Middle Ages. Um, and these entertainments and festivities form the, uh, the backbone of another course that I teach, um, which is called Medieval Festivities and Entertainments in East Anglia. 
In this course, um, we explore all types of entertainment which were really inseparable from the Christian calendar um, of festivals and saints' days, including things like Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter, Summer and Harvest, um, and also the rituals and celebrations that were, um, that were part of these. Um, and I also liked uh, to make food a big focus on this, uh, on this course because food was so important to these festivities. And um, I like to be able to make some of the recipes available to you to try them out. The course will cover some of the drama of the period, but we'll also explore music um, and some um, sporting activities such as archery and hunting. And my favourite sport from the period, and Rebecca's also already laughing, uh, camp ball, which is the ultra-violent cross and predecessor to both football and rugby. It's, uh, those of you who ever come across it, it's the most wonderful violent game ever. Uh, and we will explore that in more detail. But we will also think quite closely about why these festivals and celebrations were so important and so central to the lives of medieval people. Um, I like to teach it mostly using uh, archival sources from Suffolk and Norfolk and Essex. Um, so if possible, it's, it's nice to actually visit one of the local records offices to actually see and to be able to handle these records. Because it's like one thing to actually see them on the screen or to read a transcription of them, but to actually handle the records themselves is a whole different experience. Um, we will also, of course, uh, watch and listen to modern day interpretations of all the music and some of the plays, but I do not recommend that you go out and try camp ball for yourselves. <laughs> Just listen about it, that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Um, the final course that I offer is much more of a skills-based course. It's entitled Learn to Read Medieval Documents. Um, and this course is ideal for sort of family and local historians who want to be able to use old documents in their research, um, but perhaps can't quite read old handwriting yet. Um, but also anybody who's ever really wanted to learn how to read old handwriting or is interested in the wonderful, wonderful stories that these medieval documents um, um, produce once, you, once you're able to read them. It's a very inter uh, gentle introduction to the skills needed to read documents which are mainly in Latin, um, but absolutely no knowledge of Latin is needed at all to, to take this course. Um, I like to think of teaching uh, how to read these documents just like cracking codes, and it's incredibly addictive. Um, so those are my three courses. I did think I'd keep you for long because I know that I'm the last of a very long line of presenters today. So uh, thank you for listening to me. I don't know if you can remember earlier in the year when we had one of the AGMs and I was talking about the Norfolk Broads and the Broads project that I was involved in and how it was in the early stages and I was then sitting on the board for the Norfolk Broads representing the WEA. Well, all of the paperwork and the bid process and the proposal went through and we were successful. So we found out just after um, October half term that the Broad Authority now have something in excess of 2.6 million to work on um, five years worth of project. Um, now the reason I wanted the WA involved is because thinking of the branches in particular, the project stems over different phases and also engages with local community um, and local projects. So the projects that um, I suppose have been offered on the table is, are to do with archaeology, um, to do with um, the marshes and the water mills, to do with sort of um, geographical navigation, properties, the National Trust is involved, RSPB, and lots of other stakeholders. And what they were looking for was volunteers. Also, um, I was trying to encourage branch students that had a wealth of knowledge and experience to do what they do in our branches for day schools and courses, to possibly transfer those skills and do some work again under this project bid for the Norfolk Broads. So if you do go out and you do walks and talks or photography or with the churches, etc., all those sorts of things would come under the remit of this project, but we'll have money to do it with. 
Um, so, as I said, we've only just got the bid. The project manager, Will Birchnell, um, is quite ecstatic at the moment, but hasn't really come to grips with the fact that we've got all this money and what to do with it. So over the next, I would say, six months, he's going to pull things together so that we can see what projects we need. If you have any ideas at all about sort of community projects that you would like to put forward, obviously I can then take your ideas through when I sit on the board and we can try and get more money for those as well. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's quite exciting times and because it is five years as well, possibly longer, we can develop things. So it's not, at all, not just about sort of single one-off courses or projects. It can be a, a sort of a, a revolving event type thing that we can have running throughout the year, um, residentials, whatever you think is appropriate. But as I said, I'm turning it over to you because you have all the knowledge and experience in those areas and also as tutors you know what you could possibly um, offer um, which would fall into this project and then let me know and I will keep you posted at various events throughout the throughout next year so that hopefully we can all work together and get some of that money. Yeah, yes. Sharon, if, to give a classic example of what you're talking about, if for argument's sake we could arrange a talk and walk linked up same with Tom Williamson doing something about the landscape of the rules, which I know he's first class at, written several books about it. Are you saying then that this two something million, part of that could be used for, to fund the tutors? Yeah, power? definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So if we wanted to do something like that, we'd, we'd go to region first or no, to you. you come straight to me. <laughs> 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 you can come to, and then what will happen is when I sit on the panel and they're talking about small community bids and money they've got available, I can then say, oh, well, actually, we've got this project over here. And so, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Is, is this for communities and projects in and near the broads? Um, well, the broads, I found out, <coughs> covers quite a large remit. Um, so it's going all the way. It's following um, the natural sort of incursion of um, the Northwest Wards, but it goes all the way from Horsey Mills, I should know this, all the way down towards Lowestoft. But the geographical area is absolutely vast. So certainly in around sort of Norwich, Norfolk, the Broads area, um, there's lots of potential. But then again, if there are tutors at the other side of the border that wanted to do something in Suffolk, again, there's scope for that because they want to try and engage everybody. Um, and it was quite sad that they were saying that quite a lot of families had never actually been to the Broads, um, haven't got the facilities or resources or the money to do that. So hopefully through the WA we can address that. Is another project. So Sharon has mentioned the Broads project, which she's been involved in and which has successfully received some grant money. There's another project, one of, one of numerous, but one that we thought you might be interested in, that the WEA is running or setting up, I should say, at the moment. And uh, myself and Dave, our cameraman for today, have been involved in this very closely so far. It was thought to be appropriate, and I'm sure most of you will agree, that the WEA do something to mark the various anniversaries of the First World War. Certainly not celebrate them, but to commemorate them and to mark those various occasions. And our previous regional manager, Phil, put together a proposal for the Eastern Region to lead on a World War I-based project. And since his departure, I've inherited this from him. And Phil was adamant, and I completely agreed, that this shouldn't just be about the First World War, that it needed to be much broader than that. So this is where he came up with the title, World War I, Voices of Conflict. And the scope of this project, we're hoping to be as broad as possible. So it really is taking voices of conflict in a broader sense as possible. So we've been thinking about whose voices, the voices certainly of the soldiers, the war poets, the visual voices, if we can call them that, of war artists, but also the voices of those non-combatants who were affected directly or otherwise 
by the First World War. But then looking at subsequent conflicts, subsequent wars, and even going further back in history, so really getting to grips with that terminology. And conflict, of course, doesn't just have to be war. There are other types of conflict. So, as I said, this project is ongoing. It's still very much in development. But I wanted to mention it to you now because we are very keen to get your input into this. What we're proposing is that we have courses that already run. We've heard about some of them today. Ian's, for instance, would be an obvious one. War Wings, the, the um, Aviation and the First World War. And we identify those courses as relevant to this project and basically just badge them as such, put the logo on them, so that we can draw together all the different resources that we're already <coughs> offering. That's one strand of it. The other strand I would like you to really be involved in and at this stage I'm looking for ideas so again we haven't got time now to have a big discussion about it unfortunately but it might be something you'd like to talk to me about later it might be something you'd like to ring me about or email me about so would you like to do an event in your branch maybe you're already doing things maybe you know local history groups that are already doing work so what we want to do is pull everything together online that is already happening, see where the gaps are, see if there's anything else that you would like to add into this. So just to let you know that this is, this is in the air at the moment, and certainly in the new year, I'll be sending out a more formal communication to you, inviting requests for ideas. So look out for that, and in the meantime, hopefully, you can have a think about what you might like and what you might like us to do. Okay, that's more than enough.